It's very important for those of us who have the rare privilege and opportunity to go into space, to look down on the planet, to be able to make some kind of comment on it, to try to move our society forward, or at least help people think perhaps in a slightly different way. I do believe you don't have to go into space to think differently and try new things. We have inspiration around us all the time, and I'm going to speak to that in a couple of minutes. But I do think going into space gives us a unique opportunity, being the reality of the moment, and seeing the Earth alone and no ET around to give us a hand. So it's, it's a very sobering thing, but also a very powerful, moving uh, time uh, for any of us who go into space who really want it to be so. It's a, quite amazing that the geography teachers are right. <laughs> it is absolutely amazing. I mean, I had a geography teacher in grade 10. She wished she was wrong, but she wasn't. You know, and she had us color with these little Laurentian colored pencils, all of a sudden. Yeah. Did all that. Remember, we did all that, and we learned about the coastline and everything? She was right. Even upside down and oblique to the planet, I recognized uh, landform. So it was quite something. So to look at Earth from space is a fantastic opportunity to see things that we thought we knew, but see new patterns. We are traveling so fast, as I mentioned, just under eight kilometers a second, or about five miles a, se uh, five miles a second, Mach 25, 17,500 miles an hour. It's pretty fast. Hurricanes, how fast are they moving? Well, maybe they're moving towards the shore, maybe about 60 miles an hour, at uh, the fastest. Spinning within the center like this, around the eye, maybe 120 miles an hour, depending on the strength of the hurricane. But it looks like it's painted on this flat surface. It's curved, but it looks like it's flat, because we're traveling so fast, the stuff looks stationary. So as human beings, we start appreciating patterns differently as we pull back. Sometimes when you're taking courses and you're learning about little bits of technology getting so little down to here that you don't really see the big picture. So sometimes to be creative and innovative, you have to really step back and start looking at different patterns because the farther you move away from something, the more delicate the patterns become. I'm just going to show you this uh, short montage of photographs because these are all of planet Earth. People forget that we live on a planet. And why should people be surprised that the planet is evolving. Planet Earth is not at the end of its life. We are not on a stable shelf. We never have been. We just have to study geography. We have to study paleontology. We have to study all the things to give us some of the answers about what the Earth has been doing before to understand what it might do in the future. We learn from the past. And we learn by looking at extraordinary things. And spaceflight gives us that opportunity to step back and look at things in a much different perspective. So this is a satellite image, but as you know, it's not dark in the whole world, all around the world. We have time zones, right? So this is a, this is a, a collage, a montage of a whole whack of satellite images, but it shows you the distribution, not just of the population, because that would be foolish to say. This shows you where the energy is, because there are populations in countries that don't have a lot of night lights. And so when we look at the distribution of light across, it gives us some idea of the expansion of human beings. Now, the reason I'm putting this up is towards the end of my talk when I want to talk about the kinds of information technology can give us that we need to move forward with us as a life form to tell us things. This is a skewed map of the world so that it emphasizes where the greater population is. The difference to the left and the right image, obviously, is there's more red on the right. This is 32 years later. This is the distribution of the mosquito that carries both dengue fever and yellow fever. And it has changed for a number of reasons, one of which is some kinds of changing climate stuff, and there's no question. Number two is that the areas in which it grows are greater now because of deforestation. So we have more wetland areas and more ability for this mosquito to thrive. So we see the shift in this particular vector, and we see a shift in disease. This is one thing that we need technology a lot for. We need to monitor disease. Disease surveillance will become extremely important to all of us, and not just for human health, but health of all our, the domestic animals and animals uh, in the wild, as we see some of these things shifting. And the one thing that I'm going to tell in the old days, it used to be called a canary in the coal mine. Well, what do we have these days? Well, it's frogs. Amphibians, actually. And if we start looking at how amphibians, amphibians, remember, have two parts to their life cycle. One is as a tadpole, and one is as an adult. So they're basically 
vegetarians first and then they're carnivores second, right? So they end up eating two different parts of the food chain. So you can get disease that amphibians have. There are fungus now that they're getting and you're seeing amphibians and frogs fall out. And the ones that are at most risk are the ones where they're very small populations in a very small area, very these ecological niches that they're in. And these things are changing rapidly. So when we talk about biodiversity, it's one thing to talk about the loss of polar bears, but what about non-charismatic animals, non-charismatic life forms, people that don't have cuddly furry things and big paws will get you if you let them. What about the things that those individuals need for their sustenance? So ecosystems, complex as they are, we need technology to understand them more. And that is what I got from my space flight, was to look at the Earth without life, come back and really appreciate it afterwards, whether it was human life or not. This picture was taken off the north shore of Canada, off Katinapak National Park in Ellesmere Island. This is an ice shelf called the Wart Hunt Ice Shelf. This is 10% of the size it was 100 years ago. Well, things are changing. It's not necessarily all about human change, but we're talking that the Arctic Oceans are getting warmer. This ice shelf is getting smaller. Now, the reason why this ice shelf may be important to you is the movie The Inconvenient Truth by Al Gore. This is a far better picture. <laughs> I took this one. <laughs> this was taken actually from the co-pilot's window in a twin otter. I pulled the plexiglass down, I actually put the co-pilot in the back and he was having his sandwiches and I climbed into the front seat. And the, uh, the pilot thought that I needed to have a better picture and I could feel my eardrums going and he was side slipping. So I used opposite aileron and rudder and he's side slipping down like this so I can and he banked the plane over so I can get this nice shot out the window and you can hear everybody else screaming in the back behind the, <laughs> behind the doors. Anyway, nice shot, Roberta. So um, this, this is important because in 50 years it may not be here anymore. And it was part of this ice fringe that went all around the north of North America when they were trying to find the North Pole. They had this as ice all around and they couldn't even, they couldn't, they, they could hardly navigate through this. Why is this important to us? It's not just about Arctic warming per se. It's about what we're losing. This is part of Canada's biodiversity, but you can't see it. It lives in these little turquoise rivulets. These rivulets are summer melt, the turquoise you see, and inside are viruses, bacteria, nematodes, all kinds of life forms. Do you think they suddenly parachute in there in July? They're in there all year round. Why do we think it's important? I think it's important because we don't know, we can't classify some of these things. With a crack in the ice shelf, this is fresh water even though it's acidic. And as soon as the crack goes through, all this stuff drains into the Arctic Ocean and it's gone forever. The biodiversity we have, why is it important to us? Well, you know, we're very egocentric here. We're very self-serving. We've got to have something that's going to help us or we won't help them, right? Genetics, drought, Darkness. These things survive in all of that. What can we learn from these organisms? Well, they're already splicing stuff in tomatoes. Well, maybe don't believe in genetically modified organisms, but in order to be able to, to be able to understand how we can make the life better for a lot of people who live in different areas that, that have, are very, very challenged by some of these swings in climate, it would be very helpful to understand the genetics of these organisms. But that's biodiversity for you. And when it's gone, it's gone. Thanks a lot for being such a great group. Good luck. Thank you.